the Author's Attic, a production of the Society for the Study of Social Problems. My name is Erica Lorenzana del Villar, and today I will be joined by Professor Dana Moss of the University of Pittsburgh. In examining transnational activism of Syrian and Libyan migrants in the United States and Great Britain, Dr. Moss looks at the effects of the repressive authoritarian regime on these migrants even after they have left. She finds that despite the distance, the effects of this regime still constrain the opportunities for protest. Let's take a listen. So the central issue that this article discusses is how state repression can reach across state borders to impact diaspora communities. Um, and the effects that this, what I call transnational repression has on protest and social movement mobilization among diasporas living in Western democratic states. So specifically, I look at how the Libyan regime under Muammar al-Gaddafi uh, and the Syrian regime under the Assad family has impacted the mobilization of Syrians and Libyans who were anti-regime and left their homes and resettled in the US and Britain. interests have always been along the lines of when and why and how people can test authoritarianism. I think it's fundamental not just to the study of social movements, um, but also to major questions we have about how social change can happen. I started studying um, social movements in the Middle East just before the Arab Spring revolutions, and so this just seemed like a natural segue for me. Uh, that said, all the fieldwork I had planned to do in the Middle East because of the revolutions um, became impossible. So in that way, my attention turned to the diaspora, and I'm very glad that it did because there are a lot of things going on in these communities that we as outsiders just don't have much idea about. Questions for this particular study really came out of a grounded set of observations, such as why do people seem nervous when I show up to a protest and take out my notepad? Why are people afraid of a regime that's so far away when we're in Los Angeles? Um, so these kinds of grounded questions came, drove me to this research and uh, produced an impetus to conduct field work across the US and the UK about it. And again, I'm very glad that I did because this fact of life, the, the fear that these communities had uh, been experiencing for so long was just something that many of them told me was normal for them. Um, and for us, it just seems, I think, very surprising. So uh, it just speaks, I think, to the utility of being there, of observing, of asking basic questions um, so that we can start to unpack and empirically substantiate and theorize uh, the social constraints that these communities are subjected to um, that we don't know a lot about. And this is a particularly important for Arab and Muslim communities, of course. Not only are they subjected to xenophobia and Islamophobia and all sorts of other problems seen as this fifth column on the war on terror, uh, et cetera, in places like the United States. But now we also, I think, hopefully have more awareness about another layer of repression and of fear that these communities are subjected to and how they reconcile this and how they experience this, I think is, is an important topic that we need more research on. So whatever secondary sources I could get my hands on, whether it be journalistic reports, human rights reports, what have you, on the effects of regime repression on the diaspora I used in this study. Um, but in addition, it was important for me to listen to the people who had been affected by this. Uh, so I conducted 140 semi-structured interviews with Syrian and Libyan activists across the US and the UK. I also used uh, ethnographic participant observations and uh, wrote extensive field notes about my time participating in some pro-Arab Spring events. One of the major important findings of this study are the fact that we tend to assume that diasporas or immigrant communities that are silent on issues of uh, home country politics or repressive regimes or things that are happening back in their home country, that they're either loyal 
to that regime or that they're apathetic, that they don't really care what's going on at home. And instead, what my study shows is that people care deeply, but just because they've emigrated away from a repressive place or an authoritarian country does not mean that they're automatically empowered to then mobilize or protest against those regimes because of their transnational ties and their concerns about surveillance in their communities and their sense of responsibility, as I mentioned, to their family members and those that they leave behind. I think the takeaway of the study that I would like people to take with them to understand is that even those communities who we have assumed have escaped repressive conditions and are free to speak out and speak their minds aren't necessarily free to do so because of their transnational ties to people in places um, under the watch of authoritarian and repressive regimes. You will not be able to stay home, brother. You will not be able to plug in, turn on, and cop out. You will not be able to lose yourself on Skag and skip out for beer during commercials because the revolution will not be televised. This is a production of Social Problems, the official journal of the Society for the Study of Social Problems. Thanks for watching.